Welcome back to Local News Live. We're now going to bring you an interview on suicide. As you know, September is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. And according to the CDC, suicide is the third leading cause of death for ages 10 to 19 years old and the second leading cause of death for people that are the ages 20 to 34 years old. So I sat down and spoke with Dr. Julie Goldstein Grummet, um, a behavioral health transformation expert about what we can do to help prevent suicide. If you can kind of start out by telling us about the work that you do at the Zero Suicide Institute. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Tia. Uh, the Zero Suicide Institute at the Education Development Center um, provides consultation and training and resources for healthcare systems that are trying to embed best practices in suicide prevention because there are best practices that exist. And we know that a lot of our suicide prevention activities that we that we train people on, whether it's faith leaders or school, teachers, parents, friends, neighbors, community, is to identify people at risk and to get them to a healthcare provider. So it's really critical that the healthcare provider and the system is prepared and confident to take care of your loved one or your friend. And so what Zero Suicide is, it's a set of best practices that really entails a comprehensive approach to ensure that somebody at risk is identified, cared for, and getting evidence-based practices that reduce their thoughts of suicide and other suicide behaviors. So when we're, when we're talking about um, suicide, and, and, and I know that there are probably really staggering figures, but can you talk to us about what those numbers look like pre and post pandemic? Sure. So we know suicide in general is the second leading cause of death for youth ages 10 to 24. And COVID has impacted um, its ranking in the US as, but it's mostly remained in the top 10 leading causes of death over the last several years. And is also the second uh, leading cause of death for people up to age 44, followed by accidents, things that are preventable. And so we really need to think about um, ways that we can identify people and intervene. I think another thing that we need to think about, though, when it comes to statistics is not just people who die by suicide. Of course, that's critical and deeply impacts family and loved ones. But we also know that over a million people every year make suicide attempts and 12 million Americans every year report suicidal ideation, thoughts of suicide. So I think we greatly underestimate how many people are struggling with thoughts of suicide or in some distress. And we want to catch people early. We, we want to intervene early, not wait until they're at the point of crisis. The other thing I think with regard to the pandemic is we do read a lot about children and youth. Um, and children and youth, there was really a mental health crisis in this country before the pandemic. It's very hard to access providers. Kids in general were reporting more distress. Uh, the pandemic often really exacerbated that through people feeling more lonely, kids having less access to their peers during critical times, less opportunities to socialize and connect, um, or being at home where some of that distress can be also exacerbated and, um, and driven by experiences at home. So I don't think that we can singularly blame the pandemic for the current mental health crisis. I think we're just really seeing um, a, a long tail that the pandemic also helped to highlight, but but also with hope, hopefully people are talking about it more. I think we're in a time where people are talking much more openly about mental health uh, reduction, suicide prevention in ways that I have never seen in my you know 25 years in this field. So I hope that we take this opportunity to really open up this dialogue, have this conversation and be more um, be more honest about how we're feeling with one another and, and asking one another how we can support them. Within certain communities and those people that are affected um, by people that have, you know, have loved ones that have experienced suicide, a lot of what you hear is that um, loved ones or people close to that person were just not aware. So how would we know 
to really identify that something is an issue, what are the warning signs for someone who might be having suicidal thoughts? Yeah, I think it's such a great question. And, you know, we, there are absolutely suicidal thoughts can come on very quickly. Um, and if somebody has access to lethal means, then they can take their own life very quickly. So one of the prevention, um, immediate prevention activities of somebody that you know is talking about suicide or thinking about suicide is to reduce access to lethal means. Just during the time of a crisis, just like you take the car keys away from a drunk driver, right? Just we need to ensure that somebody is safe for that period of time. Other warning signs, things that we really want to look out for are things when people talk about wanting to die or wanting to kill themselves, we have to take that seriously. And they may not say it like that. They may not say, you know, I'm, I'm planning to kill myself. They may say something like, I just can't take it anymore, or people would be better off without me, or I just can't go on. Um, I really, I can't deal with things like this. And so I think we need to take those more subtle, but very meaningful comments very seriously and ask very directly, it sounds like you're talking about killing yourself. Is that what you're saying? I, I really want to understand how you're feeling. Are you telling me that you're thinking about killing yourself? I think other warning signs are when people look for a way to kill themselves. So in their search history, are they searching how to buy a gun or have access to means or ways to kill themselves or even just Googling things on suicide and depression? Clearly they're expressing their distress and we want to follow up and say, this is what I'm noticing. Can you tell me about that? I, I want to help you. Other warning signs are when people may talk about feeling hopeless or having no reasons to live. So again, it may not be so direct that they tell you they're thinking about killing themselves, but they're telling you in other ways that I just don't imagine things are gonna change. Or I feel like I'm a burden to my family and people would be better off without me. These are really significant red flags. In kids and youth, often it's, kids are more irritable and angry. And so they may not have that sort of Hollywood picture of lying in bed and, and looking depressed. And we need to really understand if kids are angry and irritable. I, I have teenagers too, so I know that that can just be part of teenage years. But I think there's a, a difference and we wanna ask, is something going on? I notice this is different for you or kids sometimes drop out of activities that they usually like to do. So they are spending more time at home if they were doing sports or other extracurriculars, they drop out or they're less social or spending less time with friends. Any significant shift in behavior is noteworthy and these are warning signs or things like sleeping too little, sleeping too much, pulling back and isolating. We, again, every time as a parent or as a loved one that you notice this with your colleague, with your child, with your, with your neighbor, I think it's okay to ask directly. These are things I'm observing and I'm concerned and I, I, I want you to know I'm here for you. But sometimes when people do that, it's because things are so bad, they're thinking about killing themselves. Is that something that's going on for you? And even in recognizing those warning signs, what happens if there are things that you notice, but the person that you are talking to they're not being honest with you. Is there any other recourse? I think we know that's always the fear is that by asking somebody won't be honest with you. Um, I think the research says that asking does not put the thought in somebody's head. So we can rest assured that asking with compassion and empathy and a true lack of judgment opens the door for a very honest conversation. And sometimes we do have to ask in different ways, the same question um, or be more persistent. Like I, but there is something going on for you and I am concerned. Um, is there somebody else you would wanna to talk to about this or somebody else that I can pull into this conversation? Because I am concerned. I am concerned for your safety. You're saying things that sometimes people say when they're thinking about ending their life. And I don't want that for you. And I know that help is available. I think some of that conversation is about offering hope that 
that help is available and, and can change their current situation. And yet at the same time, we can't try to solve somebody's problems. So somebody who's telling you that they're thinking about ending their life is not a moment where you can say to them, you know, I can fix that, right? It probably took a lot more than just this one experience to have them begin to feel that they were having to bring on their thoughts of suicide. And your job, just like anything else, that is to sit and to listen with, with no judgment, with empathy, truly listening, truly reflecting that you're hearing them and saying, I'm here for you and I want you to get help. And here, let's go together. Let's go to the doctor or the school counselor or to somebody who's trained to check in with them and follow up. Did they go? Um, how did it go? What happened next? And how you can continue to support them? We know that sometimes, you know, people may say they might go and, you know, things come up, they may or may not go, but we, we also need to, to ensure that they do go and let them know that you're going to continue to be a support for them. Just like as if somebody was having chemotherapy or their child was having surgery and you stepped in and said, I can help. I can pick up your other kids. I can make you dinner tonight. I can do, try to help out with things that might otherwise be obstacles. We need to treat mental health appointments and getting care just the same as we treat any other physical ailment. This is really great information, Dr. Goldstein um, Grummet. So my only other question for you is what else do you want people to know related to the issue of suicide and what we can do related to suicide prevention? I think, you know, as a country, certainly the investment in suicide prevention has um, gone up significantly over the last several years. We are in a time now, as I said, where people are much more open about talking about their mental health. Um, and I think we need to really continue to, um, you know, to lean into that and to be more open and honest. I know, you know, if I'm looking for doctors or specialists for my family, I reach out to my network of, of other parents and neighbors. And I think we, the more that we can do that with mental health, the more people recognize they're not alone. They're not the only person going through this and that there are resources and good providers available. And again, we really need to build that there is hope, that there is a path forward towards recovery um, and, and a meaningful life. I think as a country, we continue need, we need to continue to make an investment so that we really understand what treatments work for different populations, different ages, different times in our life, different settings. Um, we know many, we, many treatments work. We know a lot about um, treatment that absolutely reduces thoughts of suicide, suicide behaviors, but there's still a lot more to learn. So I hope that we will continue to make a significant advancement here. And lastly, I really think it's important that people be aware that 988 is a 24-7 free available crisis line. Anybody can call anytime, day or night, if they're worried about themselves, they're worried about a loved one, they talk to a trained professional um, who can help them through this and help connect them to resources. It is, any family can be impacted by, by suicide. It's, you know, every neighborhood, every family, anywhere um, can be impacted. And it's going to take a solution of all of us playing a role um, in being available, being honest, asking one another, supporting one another um, to continue to drive suicide rates down. Wonderful information. Um, one thing I want to just bring up, I know that was my last question, but um, it just came back to me and I think it's so important. You had previously um, and rightfully corrected me when I taught, when I used the term committed suicide or commit suicide. And I just want everyone to hear the reason why you shouldn't say that and what we should say instead. Yeah, thanks for asking Tia. I think language matters. Um, you know, we need to be really careful that somebody dies by suicide and that is, is tragic, um, but, but it, but suicide can happen, but they don't commit suicide like they commit a crime. It is the end of a string of experiences that led to their death, often an underlying mental health issue or some other experience of events that the person found to be insurmountable. 
Um, and I think that, you know, for their, both for the person contemplating suicide, not to feel like a criminal and also the, the family members who may be the loved ones who are left in the aftermath of somebody's suicide, not to make them feel even more ostracized as though their loved one, um, you know, did something that we typically reserve for what might be a criminal act. Suicide is not a criminal act, nor should it even be in that bucket. It is often something that is just a failure of events or um, an experience that somebody, you know, it is really the tragic ending to a, a string of events in a person's life. Um, and we hope to be able to change the course of that. So language matters. We have to be careful to talk about somebody. Um, you know, we are suicide survivors. Um, you know, just like people, I think you said this before, Tia, people aren't victims of sexual assault. They are survivors of sexual assault. Well, thank you very, very much for your time today, Dr. Goldstein Grummet. You have been really helpful in shedding light on this issue um, of suicide prevention. So thank you for your time today. Thank you for having me. And if you or someone you know is struggling with suicide, here's a list of resources, um, and we'll go through these. You can always dial 988. That's a suicide and crisis lifeline. All of these resources are free, and they are available 24-7. There is also the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. It's 1-800-273-TALK or 1-800-273-8255. And this provides free and confidential support for people in distress. Um, they can have prevention and crisis resources for you or your loved ones. And it also provides best practices for professionals. So again, if you're thinking about suicide or are worried about a friend or a loved one or would like emotional support, the Lifeline Network is available 24-7 across the United States. There's also the Trevor Project. It is the leading national organization providing crisis intervention and suicide prevention services to lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and questioning young people under 25. The Trevor Lifeline is a crisis intervention and suicide prevention phone service that is available 24 seven and you can text 678 or text start to 678 678. There's also a veterans crisis line, which is 1 800 273 8255. Again, a free confidential resource that's available to anyone, even if you're not registered with the VA or enrolled in a VA healthcare. So that is a list of resources. We are going to take 